Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today is going to be episode 137, and it is part seven of a seven-part series on turkey hunting, western style, with Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources. And today we're going to finish up with calling turkeys, and it's a fairly comprehensive and long episode but probably going to be one of the most popular episodes uh, we've ever had here on this podcast. Uh, Chris and I are going to draw in audio from a bunch of different hunts and be able to commentate and talk about the different turkey sounds, uh, why they're making some of those sounds, and uh, get to pick apart the uh, vocabulary of, of turkey language. So, Uh, This is going to be an awesome episode. I want to thank you guys for all your support of this podcast. I would encourage you to send me emails and also thank you for all the people that send me emails and comments every day, questions about the podcast. And you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can follow along our adventures on our YouTube channel, Outdoors on Instagram at J. Scott Outdoors and my associate Dar Colburn at Dar Colburn. That's D-A-R-R, uh, Dar Colburn. And of course, our website, jscottoutdoors.com, our guiding website, Colburn and Scott Outfitters.com and uh, GouldsTurkeyHunt.com. Guys, let's get right into this episode with Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I I really enjoyed uh, doing this episode and bringing in all the natural turkey sounds, and uh, hopefully you guys uh, will be able to use these tips and tactics uh, to successfully uh, harvest a big old gobbler this spring. So let's get right to it. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we are in part seven, believe it or not, of turkey calls, turkey calling, vocalizations, uh, all the different calls. And at the end of this episode, we're going to play a bunch of live turkeys uh, doing their thing. And it's going to be a great episode here again with Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources. Chris, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me back. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I know that this is going to be one of uh, the listeners' favorite part of this series, uh, but we've covered a lot of ground in the different episodes, you know, on, on scouting and roosting and setups and and all the different things. Uh, this this is pretty exciting. We're going to have some great audio for the listeners to listen here. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about um, turkey calling, and you know, in my mind, being a good turkey caller is definitely a, a, a strong part of the you know piece of the puzzle of being a good turkey hunter. But I know actually plenty of good turkey hunters that aren't the greatest callers. So as much emphasis as we're going to place in this episode on turkey calling, I think it's important that, you know, some of these different setup uh, episodes that we're, we're talking about, how to set up and where to set up and what have you, I think are imperative. Um, and then, of course, you know, we've all heard the guy that doesn't sound like a turkey at all. Um, and, and consistently not be able to kill birds. So I, I definitely think turkey calling is an important part of, of being a good turkey hunter. Um, we definitely want to talk about the different types of turkey calls. You basically have your box calls, your pot and peg calls, otherwise known as, say, slate calls, because uh, originally they were made out of slate, and now they're, you know, made out of glass, made out of crystal, made out of aluminum, made out of copper. And man has done a good job of finding ways for those quote-unquote friction calls, the box and and the the pot and peg, to sound pretty darn good. And then we have mouth calls as well. And and, um, mouth calling, uh, I, I believe, has gotten to a whole new level having gone to 
the NWTF and been able to go to watch the best mouth turkey calling guys in the world and quite honestly you know the top 10 probably or even top 20 of those guys that show up are fantastic uh, with a mouth call. Um, I think a mouth call is one of those things that you know unless you really practice at it um, it's, it's, it's kind of in my opinion the hardest to get the best at and it's the hardest to get proficient at and I think it's just because of the nature of the call but I'm excited to have you on today to talk about all these different different aspects of uh, turkey hunting and turkey calling I would ask you first and foremost uh, what would you say which call do you use the most probably without a doubt for me is a box call still I mean, I, I just really do love the box call, even though it's a, a call that I typically suggest for beginners to start with, just because it's so easy to learn. Um, but I, I do, I mean, just the sound, the versatility of them, and quite honestly, there's there are some birds out there that just, they will respond to a box call where they won't respond to anything else. And then if I had to pick a, a second one, it'd probably be a mouth diaphragm. Yep, I think, um, you know, for me, I love box calls. I kind of collect box calls, and um, I just, I, I like the way that each box has its own different sound, but you can also sound different and still sound good, Yeah. where I feel like also with diaphragms and mouth calls, you know, you can sound different, but they're not all good. Yep. Um, or but, or they know, all sound good, but they don't sound very different. You, I mean... I can right. sound really, really great on a raspy diaphragm, but they all sound raspy. Well, this was a little higher pitch. Well, no, it just sounds kind of medium to low or whatever pitch, but raspy. There are a, there's a world of difference in a, in a pile of different mouth calls, and it yeah, it can it, to get them all to sound good. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pick up a box here and just do a little bit of. Um, yelping on three different boxes to hopefully give the listener an idea of how three different boxes sound similar but sound different in their own right. So let me run through three of these here and, and, and I'll let you run your box too so guys can hear it. This is actually a one-sided box call. This is a Ties custom call. Uh, I think it was $20. It's one of my favorite. It's kind of my go-to box and some of the later um, audio that we're going to play here um, in this episode, you're going to hear this this exact box. And I'll go from kind of soft on all these series here with these three boxes. I'll just kind of do some light yelping, and then I'll just kind of you know get a little more intense, and you can hear the differences. That's the one-sided box call. I've also got a Primos box cutter, single-sided box that actually Will Primos, uh, the man, the myth, the legend himself, uh, signed for me, which uh, was a nice thing. He sent me this call last year. Yeah, don't, but it's got its own unique sound. Don't lose that thing. I know. Primos box cutter, and then a Pollard's Elite. Uh, this is a double-sided call. Pollard's Elite calls from Charleston, uh, Arkansas, and Jim Pollard's a multiple-time world champion turkey caller. And I, I like this raspy box. And um, Chris, you like this one too. One 
thing I like about a box too is you can kind of mess with the cadence a little bit and you can kind of work your way into it and kind of start on a little bit just kind of mellow and kind of get a little more excited as you go. So that's the Pollard box. Chris, let me hear uh, let me hear some boxes of yours or what you got. Well, I've just got the one here with me. I got the other ones downstairs. I'm remiss that I didn't bring everything to with me, but I'm getting ready for a season now. So um, no, I just most of what let me take a break here a minute. What people need to realize, well, what Jay needs to realize is is if I am ever at his house, that box call that he just ran had better be hidden very, very well. Other, be locked up. Otherwise, it's going to take a trip to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, Jim Pollard. I had a. I use his mouth diaphragms, and he, I actually was talking to him on the phone. He says, "Man, have I got some boxes that are running hard?" And I said, "Well, let me hear it." And he he ran this call right here, and I said, "I want that one." He's like, "What?" I go, "I, I want that call, that one you're running right there." And he sent it to me. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. cool. But no, I mean seriously, my workhorse. I've got uh, in, for those people. If for if you, you know the regular listeners, you might remember that I used to be associated with Primos and on their pro staff a long time ago. And so I've got pretty much all the the different box calls that Primos made, and I've got a handful of other ones too. And so I've got some really really high end fancy box calls, and I've got some just cheaper ones. But I'll tell you. Like you, you, you said you just ran a, the box cutter. The box cutter from Primos, especially these latest versions, they're all one piece. Mahogany, goodness gracious, for like 20 bucks, they are a phenomenal sounding box. It's a single-sided box, which I think is very, very easy for a lot of beginners to start on. But that that I'm telling you, that's my workhorse. I have my vest with me, and that's why I have this call. It's just the single-sided box cutter. I do. I love a really raspy uh, box. I, I mean, and different materials and the different woods that they're made out of are all going to impart a different sound. You know, whether it's poplar, which is very soft wood, which is going to kind of give you that high and clean, high pitched, clean sound and two tone yelps to it. Really nice. Uh, same thing with you know cedar. You can get some really sweet, mellow sound in cedar, but man, you get in some of these mahoganies and other hardwoods. They just give that really good, harsh raspiness to it, and I just love it. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk a little bit while we're talking about box calls. Um, you know, I, I like to keep chalk on my calls uh, all the time. I'm constantly chalking my box calls. And, you know, there's a bunch of ways to chalk your box call, but I like to chalk uh, with the length of the lid, so not against the grain, but I, I, I like to go the full length of the lid, if that makes sense. Um, and I actually get some chalk from, it's actually, a, a, it look, it's got a little turkey on the end, and it's about, oh, four inches long, and it's actually made by Lynch. It's a Lynch box calls chalk, and I've used it for years. And um, they're like four inches long, and they're about like, uh, the you know, the diameter of a, of a Lifesaver, and you know, that, that one piece of chalk has lasted me for years, and I, I put that chalk on all my box calls. And one thing I will say, too, is um, you want to keep your box calls dry. Um, if your box calls get wet, uh, that can change the sound, certainly when they're wet, but it can change their sound forever. Um, and you can also use a box call in the rain, um, if you get like a bread, a plastic bread bag, you can keep the box call actually in the plastic bread bag with a, with a rubber band around the end and it still works fine. It's not quite as loud. Um, but you definitely want to keep your box calls dry. For, well, and, and then let me, let me, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but, um, just for those, for the box calls that are not treated with a waterproof coating, you, there are some box calls out in yeah, synth, there's some that's synthetic, a good point. There's some synthetic ones, and I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not a fan of the sound of most synthetic box calls. However, 
Um, and again, I, I have one because Primos sent me one, but Primos makes them and several other manufacturers make them. They are a wooden box call, but the wood is either treated or they will have a basically a, uh, for lack of like a black. Color. There you go. It's a basically a friction surface bonded to the wood that is waterproof. So the, the, the call will still work when it is wet. However, the rest of the call still would. So you still need to be careful with it. So yes, you, yeah. there are call, there are box calls you can get that are waterproof. But and and uh, my friend Casey Brooks, who lives in the Northeast, he uh, obviously has a lot more rain and deals with a lot more moisture than I do. And he was running a couple boxes, and I think they're fairly cheap. And I I want to say they were called Mystic. Um, I don't even know if that I don't know if that's the name of the manufacturer, but I think it was a Mystic. And it had that black surface, and he actually had a handful of them that some of them didn't sound very good, but a handful of them sounded pretty darn good. Um, and even so much as he was letting me use it, I, I was using it, just running it, because I'm a I just love box calls. So I hear one that I like, I'm you know I I, I like to get them in my hand and play with them. He's like, take it out, and so I actually went out uh, when we were hunting and used it a little bit. But uh, that's a good you know if you're hunting in areas where it's wet. And there's a lot of moisture. You might look into getting some of those, you know, wet box or whatever they call yeah. them. Um, but you, and, but and, you, you know, you also hit something very important too. Now, I will tell you that manufac well, manufacturers probably don't care. Retailers might. Um, but you're absolutely right. We're to, we're dealing, if you're talking about a, a box call, you're talking about wood, and all not all wood is created equal, and the grain and how it's cut, all that stuff plays into if a box call sounds good or not. Like you just said. He had several of those wet boxes or whatever that some sound good, some don't. Well, you're absolutely right. I've got, I have some uh, boxes, box calls that are just in a tub. They just sound horrible. Um, but some sound better than others. So even along, um, among, one, among the same calls of the same manufacturer, if you have time and the retailer isn't going to kick you out of the store, I seriously recommend you open the package. Most of them are bubble packages now. Just open the package, run the box call, see how it sounds to you, and if you like it, buy it. If you don't, put the thing back in, grab another one. And another tip I'll add is, like, I've gone to the National Wild Turkey Federation convention, and one of the things that I like the most about going to the convention is you show up and every, almost every manufacturer out there is there. And on their booth or in their booth and on those tables, they just have like hundreds of boxes and hundreds of slates and obviously not the, the mouth diaphragms that you can try, but you can sit there and you can run different strikers and then with the boxes, you can just play each one of them and I'll go and, you know, buy, you know, eight or ten boxes every every convention and by the time I get home, maybe some of them that I bought for whatever reason when I get home, they just don't sound as good. But I'm one of those guys that I very rarely ever throw a box away yeah. um, because what I like to do on boxes that, you know, I have my top, you know, three or four or five that I, you know, run for the season and the rest stay in a little box or a big box now. Um, the next year, I'll kind of get them out. I'll get my screwdriver out. I'll get my sandpaper out. And, you know, I don't recommend this to start sanding down the lids. But if you've got a call that's just a dog and you're like, you can't revive it, it doesn't, you might as well tinker with it. Yeah. Um, you know, and start sanding a little bit on it. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, get your screwdriver out and you can adjust the tension. Um, on the screw that attaches the box and w where you can tighten it or loosen it. Um, I had a call that I just couldn't get it to sound and I started messing with it with my screwdriver, loosening and tightening and chalking and finally I got it sounding pretty darn good. And so um, I, I never like to throw box calls away. I like to give them away. Um, and, you know, and I'll sell them too if someone wants to buy them. You know, if someone wants to come over and play with them and say, "Hey, I like this call. How much you want for it?" Um, but uh, and the other thing is, I like to call little mom and pop manufacturers up, and I like to say, "What do you got?" Oh, I got these boxes, and I got this, that, and the other, and I'll say, "Play them for me." So they'll play them right over the phone, and I'll say, "Nah, give me something a little sweeter," and so they'll. Okay, yeah, give me something a little more raspy. Okay, I want those too. And um, I think that's pretty cool how you can, 
you know, talk to these guys and, and have them play them for you over the phone, uh, you know, and, and then you kind of know what you're getting. Yeah, and that is very true for cedar. Cedar is a very fickle uh, wood. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, man, you get a good cedar box call, geez, oh, Pete, it's worth its weight in gold. But finding a good one can be a nightmare sometimes. Let's take a break right here, Chris, and then we'll go right back into um, the different calls. Okay, that's um, we've covered box calls. Um, let's talk a little bit about the other friction calls. Let's just talk about for for you know um, for this episode. Let's just talk about slate calls uh, or pot and peg calls. And I'll run this. This actually I've had this Primos Crystal, <laughs> the 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 freak, and I've probably had let's say fifty or sixty other. Um, uh, pot calls, and I always kind of go back to this one. I like a slate because you can purr on it. You can cluck on it. You can yelp on it. And one thing I found with pot and peg calls is all strikers sound different. So I'm a collector of strikers as well. I've probably got, I don't know, 30 or 40 or maybe more strikers. And sometimes I end up mixing one manufacturer with another and find a sound that I like. Um, I like a crystal call and I like a, like I've got a Woodhaven slate call um, in my vest. And the slates are real soft, you know, kind of subtle, sweet sound. And the, the crystal is one that you can actually get a little more aggressive and, you know, really reach out there on windy days and, and strike those birds. Um, I, I, I love friction calls. Um, I'm big into box and pot and peg. Um, one other thing is you don't want to get your uh, pot and peg, you don't want to get the surface of your quote-unquote slate calls or crystal calls. You don't want to get them wet. Now, just like the box call, there are some manufacturers that are now making some friction calls that you can literally pour a cup of water on. And and to demonstrate this at the NWTF convention, they actually have them sitting in water and you can still play them. Um, and most of but, and, and unless they've changed something, most of, it, most of that is because what they're doing is they're running a synthetic striker. Right, a synthetic striker. And they also sell these synthetic strikers and they, you know, the... They'll say when you, whatever call you're using, uh, pot and peg style, you can use this synthetic striker and it'll work even when your calls, you know, wet as can be. And, it, and it's true. And it, and it maybe doesn't sound quite as good, but it still sounds sounds good in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you use the uh, pot and peg much, Chris? I do, and I, I'll use it. Most of the time, I will use it uh, first thing in the morning. If I'm going to do my treat, and we're going to get into this later, but it, my subtle sounds from my tree yelps in the morning that usually it'll be a pot and peg that I'll be the first call just to just to wake up just to make that initial contact real soft subtle stuff or if I need to to uh, really make it sound like I'm doing fighting purrs or if I'm if I'm trying to do purrs I can do purrs with a mouth call but I really I, they sound bad I mean, to me I don't like them yeah I don't purr on a mouth call I, I've, I've just, never been able to no but mine sounds like a fighting purr I can't yes I, I just can't get it right. Yeah, so if I'm going to do purrs, subtle purrs or subtle, subtle sounds, I love the pot and peg. And same thing, I've got a, I, not a pile of them, but for everything from the natural slate, like you said, is, you know, typically it's going to be a much more mellow sound. Those are not forgiving as far as moisture. You get any drop of moisture on them and your that call's done until it dries out. But um, most of the time I'm using a synthetic surface. I'm using the crystal glass I, the power crystal has been all it just been my go-to call or um there's some that used to have a titanium infused surface that had built-in grit to it or a ceramic surface i mean there's so so many different surfaces out there that uh you just really need to put one in your hand play with it and then see which one gives you the best sound and which one responds well to you and how you hold things because that makes a big difference as well yeah, and, and I will say that you want to not palm the call and, and um, muff the sound. You want to kind of, in my mind, 
hold the call like you would if if like I don't know what the term is that like holds a diamond in a in a ring. It like kind of holds it up in the air. Um, that's kind of how you want to hold these pot and peg because you want the sound to be able to echo out through the bottom. Yeah. So it, don't don't just maul it with your hand. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Make sure kind of hold it in your fingers. Well, and and I and I will say that some will say, oh no, you can hold it. Okay. Basically, Jay's right, but the. Is the basic thing is with a pot and peg style call, you want to hold it around the perimeter of the of the call, not on the bottom. The sound comes out of the bottom of the call, and so as long as there's you're not contacting the bottom of that call excessively or at all, you'll have better resonance, you'll have better tone, better sound, and depending on how you call and how, or how you hold that, you can you know better direct or make it loud or make it soft. But yeah, you hold the perimeter of the call, uh, not on the bottom. So you don't, you don't set it flat on your, your leg and then use it from there. Unless you buy a call specifically, uh, that's manufactured to give you room underneath there. There's Primos makes one like that, that has this little chamber on there so you can put it on your leg, but there's some manufacturers that make a little stand that you can clamp to your call so you can clamp it to your leg. So just remember the sound comes out the bottom of the call and you don't want to muffle that. Yeah, and, you know, as far as care for pot and peg style calls, um, or, you know, one thing is you want to sand the call, okay, which is what Chris, you can hear him doing in the background. And sometimes you want to sand the tip of your striker, too, to keep it where you want that maximum friction. Um, you know, what grade sandpaper are you using? You know, I use the real fine sandpaper. And I think with each surface, it's different. Sometimes you want a little grittier, and sometimes you want a little finer. Yep. And, and, and quite honest, and I know this sounds like all sorts of qualifications, but quite honestly, it also depends on the peg you're using and how you hold it and how you do it. So some people have a very firm grip to where they, they can get away with a fine, uh, fine sanding. Other people have a very soft grip to where they can use probably a little bit more aggressive sanding. I mean... These things, that's the thing is, I mean, you, you can dive down the rabbit hole on, on getting into calls and just getting geeked out by, you know, all the different calls and how you play with them. But yeah, you want that friction. You need to have that friction. So many people call me and, you know, they'll buy a brand new call and they're like, this thing, I can't get any sound out of it. Well, okay, you just, you just pulled it out of the package and it literally came out of the mold slick as a glass table. You need to rough it up. Yeah, so Chris, um, do you have a friction call, a pot call right there that you could run? Yeah, I've got, and same thing with Jay. I've got, I don't know how many stinking strikers because each one's different. Um, but the Power Crystals usually has a very crisp, clean, higher pitch sound to it. That's huge. That's, that's, that is usually my go-to one. Um, this one's a di little different crystal. And I'm out on the edge on that one just to try to get a little bit more of a two-tone yelp on it. But, yeah, that Power Crystal is pretty much the one I go to all the time. I mean, it's just a good, consistent sound to it. And, I mean, I can, and I know the microphone is going to amplify. That's the thing with these computer microphones, and it'll, it'll adjust the volume, but... I mean, I can be so quiet with it if I need to. And that's why I love it for those early morning tree yelps. Just real subtle. That's awesome stuff. Um, and then we've got um, mouth calls. And I would say that... Um, I always have a mouth call with me. I always have a mouth call in my mouth. Um, and But I don't mouth call a ton. I'm going to lean more on my friction calls. Uh, I have been trying to become a better mouth caller for a long, long time. And I think I have gotten better. Um, and I keep saying every year that I'm just going to go out and just take a mouth call and live and die by the mouth. And I, I think that's 
what you almost have to do in order to get really good at it. And I just find myself leaning back so much on my friction calls that, uh, you know, I would just consider myself a mediocre uh, mouth call uh, caller. And there's all kinds of mouth calls. Um, the one that I'm going to blow here, I've actually got two of them. They're from Pollard's Elite uh, Calls out of Arkansas. And um, they're kind of a, there's all sorts of cuts as well on a mouth call. And there's all sorts of reads. Some are, you know, double reads, triple reads, you know, quad reads. Uh, there's all different types of cuts. You've got the, you know, split Vs. You've got the combo cuts. You've got the, you know, the, um, the ghost cuts. Um, there's all sorts of cuts and they all do different things. Um, this is just a standard you know, kind of a Yelp on, on a mouth call that I use. Kind of a raspy. Yeah. Raspy. Um, and then this is... This is another one. So there's the mouth calls, and there are a ton of resources in my mind to listen to great mouth callers. I actually just had Scott Ellis. He's a multiple... Uh, time world champion mouth caller, or he's actually done well in, in friction calling too, but um, he's a phenomenal mouth caller and, and there's a ton of resources. I think one of the great things with the internet is there's a ton of resources out there to learn how to uh, become a better caller, both with the mouth uh, and with the friction call. Um, and then you've got obviously row hunting resources is a phenomenal uh, tool to uh, listen to the actual turkeys themselves. Um, and then Chris also has some great turkey calling stuff on his uh, turkey module. Uh, Chris, what do, you, what do you want to say about mouth calls? The number one thing people need to realize is everybody's mouth is built a little differently, and so different mouth calls are going to fit differently. And, you know, Jay went through and said, you know, there's different cuts and there's different reads, you know, different numbers of reads and different thicknesses of reads and different stretch of reads and different cuts and reads. And Okay, all of those matter, and all of those are going to give you a different feel and they're going to give you a different sound. But the other thing, too, to keep in mind is you need to take a look at the different frames, all right? Each frame, the frame is the structure of the call, and then you have the tape. So the frame is what holds the latex in place. And then the frame has tape on it. And that's that half moon shaped tape that that seals it to your mouth. Well, the tape and the frame both are critical in figuring out if that call is going to fit your mouth or not. And you've got to find a call that's going to fit your mouth. It's just like buying boots or sneakers. There's all sorts of different sneakers out there. And you can get a red pair, a, a white pair, a blue pair, a black pair. doesn't matter. If they're one size too small for your feet, it does not matter what color they are. They're not going to fit any better, and they're still going to pinch your feet. All right? So uh, be, beyond just looking at the different cuts, I always tell people, if you're going to start out, if you're just, if you're just now starting out, you're a beginner, or if you want to play around with new ones, get a variety pack. Because there's even some that are just straight regular frames, and there's others that have the, the sound dome or the, you know the pallet plate or whatever. There, there's different styles of frames. There's different sizes of frames, and there's different materials with the tape. If you get a variety pack, which I recommend you do, make sure that that variety pack has a variety of types of calls, not just versions of the same call. Make sense? So that way it will let you figure out which one works for. Maybe you have a small palette and you need a mini. Well, there are a number of different people that make mini frames and all sorts of different calls inside those mini frames. Well, great. You just know you need a mini frame. So start, you know, just stay within the mini frames. Or maybe you like a palette plate style. Okay, well, there's a several, you know, Bugling Bull and um, 
Primos make the pallet plate, and you can buy a pile of different versions, but they have the pallet plate, and they work for you. So keep that in mind. Make sure you play around with different styles. Find the one that you get the best sound out of that you can work comfortably, and then branch out and go from there. I think that's great advice. The other thing I would say is um, I like using reed separators when you're using uh, you know, a double or a triple or even a quadruple um, latex call. Um, I think once your latex sticks together, it all acts as one, and it turns in, you know, guys say, oh, I use my elk diaphragm to turkey call. Well, you're probably not getting that two-tone, two-dimensional, three-dimensional sound. You're, you're, well, three-dimensional, I don't know if that's possible, but you're not getting that. You're just getting that kind of one-tone sound. You want to separate those reeds with little reed separators, or you can use toothpicks. The other thing you want to do is you want to keep those calls in a uh, cool, dry place. A lot of people put them in a plastic bag and put them in the refrigerator because yep. that latex over time breaks down. The worst thing you can do is have those calls in your truck letting the sun beat on them. The second worst thing you can do is put, I wear a lot of chapstick and I get chapstick on my calls and literally you'll go to call and it won't even make a sound. And it's like the latex just literally shrivels up. Um, you really need to watch what you get on that latex of that mouth call. You good, buddy? Yeah. And before we jump into the vocalizations, real quick, um, I, I just want—I there's a couple things that, I, or one main thing that I've been thinking as we've been going along here. You know, Jay and I are going to be talking about some broad strokes on some things and some generalities, and we're not really diving into the weeds on you know actually using the box call, using the slate call, and that type of stuff yet. But you know, there's I think there's really kind of three different levels of callers, and I think we all start and we we go through each phase depending on on how much time and effort we want to put into them. Um, you know, you can be what I call an effective caller, meaning you you, you might not be uh, well, the three I say, effective caller, you can be a proficient caller, or you can be an expert caller. You know, the people that are up on the, the stage at the NWTF championships and that type of stuff, those those are expert callers. I mean, they, goodness gracious, are they good. I mean, they just flat, they'll just amaze you. Your jaw just hangs slack when you just listen to them. Sounds like a turkey on the oh, stage. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're just, they're phenomenal. Those are expert callers. And are those expert callers effective in the field and kill birds? Oh, yeah. Am I an expert caller? No. I, I will tell you right now, I am not an expert caller. I kind of classify myself as a proficient caller, meaning I know how to make all the sounds that I need to make in the field, and I can make them on each of the different calls that I have, whether it's a box, whether it's a slate or you know, pot and peg or a mouth call. I can make them all. But I'm not going to sound like the guys on the stage. I, they're, you know, like I said, I can purr on a mouth diaphragm, but I can do it loud. I can do a fighting purr, and it doesn't sound great. I really am not. I just don't have the skill set even now to be able to do a real soft, subtle, sexy, you know, well, just like purr. Chris, to your point, I think you're 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 making a great point in that everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses, and you can kill turkeys. And just be an okay caller. Yeah, and that's, and that's like I, I that think effective the, caller. Yeah. The, the the converse of that, or the opposite of that, is I've heard a lot of guys on a mouth diaphragm that really have no business sure. even using a diaphragm, and their buddy needs to be able to say, "Listen, buddy, you know, stick to a box or a friction. It just doesn't sound right." And they'll say, "Well, they'll gobble to it." Yeah. If you're not consistently calling turkeys in with your mouth call consistently and calling hens in, you're probably not doing yourself any good. And I think, you know, I don't want to talk people out of trying and, you know, working on their calling, but, you know, I've heard a lot of guys, and quite honestly, I've just finally gotten to the point where I'm not one of them, but I'm not far above but I've heard a lot of guys that really have no business trying to kill a turkey using their time efficiently and blowing a diaphragm. Well, if you know you're one of those, use a friction call where you, your, your inconsistencies and your lack of practicing and quote-unquote talent 
will be hidden a little bit in these other devices. Well, and I would argue that, I mean, there's people out there that are still having, that are struggling with a box call or a, a slate call. Uh, most of the time, and, and not to dive into the entire turkey module on my website, but, I mean, I go into all this. There's fundamentals, basic fund, core fundamentals on how to operate the call and I don't care whether it, and, and then fundamentals of the structure of the vocalization that the hen is doing. So the yelp is probably the most ubiquitous. I mean, they, they, everybody talks about yelping. Okay. Well, there is a fundamental structure to a yelp. We can, we can talk about different volumes. We can talk about different cadence. We can talk about different raspiness. We can talk about different pitch. All of those are, that's fine. Those separate different hens from different hens and different vocalizations from different vocalization, vocalizations. But the general structure of a Yelp has a, generally speaking, has a lower portion, a higher portion. There's a roll over that shoulder, that break where it goes to high to low, and one leads into another. There, there are certain fundamental fundamentals that if a person is struggling with on a mouth diaphragm, or they don't sound realistic, or they don't sound realistic on a box call, or they don't sound realistic on a slate call, my experience is... If they are, if they know how to run the, the 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 call that they're running, most of the time it's just that they're they either don't know, they've forgotten, or they just aren't executing the fundamentals of the vocalizations themselves. And so, and I obviously, and I don't know how Jay, you tell me. I mean, I don't know how far down in the weeds you want to get on some of this because we want to try to make this into one episode. But goodness gracious, we can make it into three in itself. But well, I think you hit the nail on the head, too, in that, you know, you've got a lot of stuff on row hunting resources where people can learn about cadence and timing and, you know, the fundamentals of good turkey calling. And, and running the calls. I mean, you know, there when you run a box, there's a way, I mean, when you run that lid across the soundboard, you want to do it in a certain way so that way you do get that two-tone sound out of it. And then from there, once you understand why that box call works the way it does and how you get that fundamental sound, then you go, oh, oh, I want to be loud and I want to be raspy. Okay, run that sucker hard and fast. Okay, but I want to be soft and subtle. Okay, do that. Don't move it as much. Don't put as much pressure, but still maintain that lid on that, you know, the sweet spot of that sound or, or in the, the sweet spot on that lid so that way you get the two-tone yelp. So people that that struggle with sounding good or, you know, they, they hear people and they're like, oh, my gosh, he sounds awesome. I suck. I'm not going to call. Most of the time, it's because you just need to understand how your call operates and how to get the fundamental sounds out of that call so that you properly execute a yelp or a cluck or a purr or whatever. So don't be discouraged. I mean, it's 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 easy to identify, and I think anybody can identify it and look at it and see it. Um, I, and again, I don't know if you want to get into that here, or if you want to. Keep well, I, I, it's up to you. But I I think you know, don't be discouraged. But I'm also playing a little bit of the devil's advocate of I've had I guide turkey hunters, and I've had guys that have shot lots and lots of turkeys. And they come and they say they want to do their own calling. And then they go into their calling repertoire, so to speak. And I just shake my head thinking, how in the world did they even ever kill a turkey? Yeah. And, and you know, they kind of look over at me like, I don't know what's going on. Why isn't he coming in? And I'm just thinking, you know, how am I going to, <laughs> one, keep a straight face and still make two, my tip? <laughs> And how am I going to maintain a decent hunt here when it's like, okay, this is not going to work unless we ambush them and, you know, let get me, right in front of them. Let me try something different. Yeah. So, and you know, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the greatest turkey caller in the world at all. Not, e not even close. But there are some people that you need to know your limitations and you need to figure out what are the best calls you can make and that's what you need to stick with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, let's talk about the different vocalizations. Um, go into turkey vocalizations a little bit. Well, you know, 
as a biologist, I mean, you know, if you if you look at the turkey biology themselves and communication and all that, I mean, I think that wild turkey has been shown to be one, if not be one of the most vocally diverse birds on the planet. I mean, seriously, I think the last time I heard there was like 20-some different unique vocalizations that all mean something different that turkeys use throughout their life cycle and throughout the year. For hunting, you don't need to know all those. I mean, really, it really boils down to clucks. Well, yeah, yeah, geez, yeah. Yelps are probably the most, the, the number one. You you want to know your yelps and, and be able to do an effective yelp. After the yelp, I think clucks are important to be able to do. I think after clucks, maybe you learn to purr. And if you learn the the yelp, the cluck, and the purr, then maybe start stepping it up to where you say, okay, I want to be a little bit more aggressive to where I want to learn how to do uh, cuts or cutting. Uh, but there's other vocalizations called the kiki that it can be a very, it's a, that's the sound that a young bird makes when it wants to get back and grouped back up with the flock. They can be effective. But really, for the beginner and those that are start, they're starting out, even if you haven't started out, but you're still struggling with your calling, get your yelps right. So your yelps, clucks, purrs, and then I'm cutting are the four that I use 99% of the time. And most of the time, it's yelps. Okay, and then uh, there's several types of yelps. Um, can you go through those? Yeah, I kind of break it down. Um, realistically, there's there's probably three that are easily identifiable. Ones that are called the assembly yelps. They are typically used by a hen, especially when she's dealing with her poults. It keeps the poults together, keeps the group together. Oftentimes, they're going to be very, very high-pitched. They're going to be very, very quick, fast-paced. Um, I, Jay, do you want me to play an audio clip of it now, or do you want to do those later? Yeah, okay. I think that'd be great. All right, well, while, I'm, while I'm talking about it, I'll, I'll cue it up a little bit. and uh, I can always edit it in, too. Yeah, no, I, it, it's right here. Um, but those are usually high-pitched, fast-paced. Now, this, all right, well, let, me, let me set this up. This is me. You're going to hear me doing key keys just with my whistle. That's me whistling. And I'm going to, and this is literally in October. I was getting ready to set some tree stands. I didn't have a turkey call in my mouth. I'm, I'm yelping with my voice. So don't judge me. But, uh, it's a hen with poults and they're in a standing Milo field and they're only like 30 yards from me and they were making their way to me, but she was out there with her poults and the poults were key keying. And she was doing the assembly yelps, and so that's what I did. I was just trying to sucker her out of, and this is all on the, the turkey module. It's the video. You can actually watch the birds doing this. But um, I tried sucking her, suckering her out of the Milo so I can get some video of footage of her. So that was just me, me keeking, but here you go. You hear that high-pitched, fast pace? that There she is. Okay, now those those are the key keys coming back, but you can hear that hand just out there. So it's high, very very high pitched, almost you know flute like or or almost songbird like, and very very fast paced. Those are good, especially, I mean, those are great in the fall if you're fall turkey hunting or if you're in a situation where you have a big flock and you know that you have a bunch of poults running around and younger birds running around and you want to sound like a, 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 a hen trying to call that rest of the flock in. But the assembly yelps are, are not something that I use a lot. Uh, the plain yelps, those are, when you listen to the plain yelp, I the two that I use most, I, I kind of just segregate them into two styles. High pitch, fast paced, and then um, low, what I call low and slow. And they're two different, they're used for two different purposes. And I think it's important for people to really... There's your... 
there's your classic high pitch, fast pace, your normal, what normal people do, what normal hunters are using, just that normal, standard, plain yelp. Okay, and we've got some more plain yelps. We'll talk, you know, at the end here. You know, Jay's got some audio clips that are awesome. Just that high pitch, just yop, 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 yop. and they can be really excited, really loud, really raspy, really fast. I mean, just just going crazy. Or they can be subtle like this, where they're just a good even cadence, yop, 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 but really accentuates that high note in the higher portion, and it's a little bit more fast paced. And then from there. Um, the other one, and this one is, you know, typically people will say, well, this is, you know, the vocalization of a boss tom or a, or a uh, old mature, or excuse me, not a boss tom, boss hen or an old mature hen, what I call that low and slow. You can hear how, and I'm calling, I'm going to play it some more here in a minute, but you can hear how, I'm, in this case, I'm not accentuating the high note of the call. I'm accentuating that lower note and almost going, ow, 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 to it. And in this situation, what I've got is there's a gobbler, obviously, and he's got a small group of hens. And there's one hen that's doing the high pitch, fast pace, that higher, that just regular, normal, plain yelp. And she, you know, if you and that's the beautiful thing about being able to watch the video and watch the body language and the, and the body posturing of the birds, because it's really going to help you understand what they expect from what they hear and what they expect from you from what they're saying. Their body language says a lot. And so you got one hen in here that's doing the high pitch, fast pace, just the standard plain yelp. Her head is up, she's looking, she's seeking, she's, you know, she's actively looking for someone. And those high pitch, fast pace ones, that's, that's kind of what it is. It's essentially, it is a hen that is seeking someone else. Now, maybe that's her moving her way to you, looking for you, or that maybe she's standing out there, she's excited, calling, just, she wants you to show her, or wants you to show yourself. They want to get grouped up. They want to get together, but it's seeking. Whereas this one, when you get to that low and slow, most of the time that is a dominant hen that's saying, no, 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 no. There's the high pitch. And I just mimic her. And then you can hear that low and slow, ow, ow, ow. That's a hen saying, no, I'm the dominant one. I'm not going to you. You just need to come to me or, or I'm the one in charge of this group. So those are really, for me, if, if we get down in the nuts and bolts of what I do most of the time as far as yelping, it's going to be one of those two. If I want to get a response, I want to get a bird gobble and I want to get him fired up, or if he's already fired up and I want to build that excitement to where he wants to come in, most of the time I am using that, just that higher, that high pitch, fast pace, plain yell of whatever volume that I need to give him. But if it gets to the point where he's hung up or I'm, you know, we talked about this in a previous episode where we, if you have to challenge other hens, if you've got to go to battle with other hens, you cannot beat that low and slow. You get to that, and I mean, my gosh, you're, you're screaming that you are a dominant hen. You, the, that flock needs to listen to you, not the other hens. And it's, it's a great way to get those birds to all come your way. So for me, those are, those are my two, that's my bread and butter. The high pitch, fast pace, plain yelp, and then that just low and slow yelp. Let's take a quick break right here. Okay, Chris, we've covered the different yelps. Let's cover the clucks. All right, clucks, I mean, clucks are, are basically done when turkeys are more inquisitive. They are curious. They are... Um, yeah, and a lot of times I consider them more support vocalizations. There are times when hens will just sit in, they'll just come in and cluck at you. 
uh, and that's all. That's the only vocalization that they'll make. But a lot of times you'll hear them in support of either purrs or they're in support of the yelps. You hear them yelp, 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 cluck, 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 yelp, yelp, cluck, yelp. You know. So, but most of the time when you hear a bird that's clucking, especially if they're clucking and purring, they are curious. They are inquisitive. They are. They they are very interested in what they see as far as your decoys or what they hear as far as your calling. And so let me I'll play just this this is a, a hen just clucking and purring. I'll turn the volume up a little bit so she you so you can hear her. And in this case, this hen, basically, she's coming in and she sees the decoys. And, I mean, she can't get there fast enough. She's just looking and, and really curious, checking them out, just going in and out of them, just loving them. So, clucks, again, are another vocalization that I think people should learn to use simply because of that. Because sometimes if you want to be really subtle and quiet, but you want to still relay the idea that there's hens around or a hen around or that, and that she's just minding her own business and she's just curious about what else is going on. You'll hear a few just clucks here and there and maybe add some purrs in there with it. Um, if you want to add some realism to your yelps and you want to add another layer so you can, you can yelp and then put your clucks in there with it. So clucks for me are probably the second tier of the something that I, that I'm going to learn to do. And, and likewise, the purrs, the purrs, those are typically made by a very content hen or very content turkey when they're very soft and subtle all right very content inquisitive you heard her doing those clucks and purrs however the purr vocalization can when it starts to increase in volume it can start to relay also a level of agitation and and, bit, and that's why they say fighting purrs and i know jay you got some a good clip of that um that we'll play here in a second but fighting purrs you get very 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 loud very very harsh and raucous and I mean, you, I mean, when I say loud, they can just get flat out, extremely loud, and they just carry on forever. It seems so. I want to say something about the cluck on a box call, and maybe you can demonstrate it on a box or on a um, yeah. on a friction call. There's a lot of way to do the clucks with a box call. You can simply put your finger and kind of block the lid and then with your, say your right hand, just kind of pop it like this. Or you can lift the lid and kind of click it off like this. There you go. And that's my favorite way. And then you can run that into a yoke. Yeah, and I, for people who start now, if you're just starting a call, I really do recommend you do that. Like Jay said, put the paddle down, and basically you're going to have to find the sweet spot, that middle part of your lid. Put that middle part of the lid down in the middle part of that soundboard, and then put a little downward pressure, and then just kind of flick your wrist a little bit and get that to pop. And I like doing it that way to start and teaching people to do it that way to start because it very clearly clearly is a cluck at that point. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a very clear cluck. If you, if you start playing around with, and it, it's very effective, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to contradict Jay at all. But when you're just starting out and playing with it and practicing with it, if you try just popping the lid, if you don't have that lid in the sweet spot, it can very easily ble- sound like an alarmed putt. Now, an alarmed putt, is a well it's it's an alarm sound it's a it's a it's a vocalization it's a, let's get out of here boys yeah it's, and girls. it's heads up pay attention danger could be around we're out okay and it's it's a very similar structure but there's a difference in as far as what the sound quality is a cluck is more raspy through the whole thing and a put is very clean and put, put, okay so there's a difference and if you and if you don't get the your lid in the right spot on your soundboard, and you don't, you're not familiar with the call. You can end up doing an alarm putting, and all of a sudden, everybody's heads go up, and now they're standing around, and they're like, "Oh, what's going on?" So, let's hear you um, 
do some clucking on a friction, on a uh, pot and peg. Yeah, and and that's the other thing too is with pot and peg. For the friction calls, again, you can spend some time in practice, but you know, put your put your striker to the surface, put some downward pressure. You want a little bit of an angle to that that, uh, and it, this is where audio does not help you. You really need to watch somebody and see a video or or watch somebody do it because the angle of that striker is important. But you're just trying to you're basically pushing it in just to put a little bit of pressure into the surface of that, and apply a little bit of pressure with your finger until that pops, and just give that nice single. All right, for your cluck, and you can do it loud, you can do it soft, all based on how much pressure you put on your finger and how much downward pressure into the surface you do. And then on a pot and peg style call, the other thing that's nice about them is you oftentimes will find a sweet spot in the middle of the call that gives you that nice, low, mellow, or, or really raspy sounds. Or you can start to creep out to the edge of those calls, and you can also get a higher pitch, a little bit cleaner sound. So you can really diversify the sounds that you're making with that pot and peg style call just from the place you put that striker on that surface. Great point. Um, great point there. Chris, let's roll into uh, the clips and the different sounds that we have here and, and run some of those. Sure. Let's set up that first uh, Bill's, or excuse me, it's uh, Rennell's Hunt. Uh, we're down in Sonora, Mexico. This is, uh, we, we had birds roosted from the night before, and uh, it's real early in the morning. What you're going to hear are these birds are still on the limb, and you're going to hear the progression of how the hens are kind of waking up, and they're going to get a little bit more um amped up as the clip goes on and it's a couple minute clip here and this is a perfect example of how i work birds off the roost uh when there's hens involved you'll notice how i kind of get a little more uh into it uh as the clip progresses so let's roll that clip Jay, can you hear me if I talk over this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, beautiful thing about this is, and I wasn't even on this hunt with you. You can hear you can hear Jay doing that high pitched, fast paced yelps, but the hen is doing it too. And now we've talked about this in here. Let me let me push pause. Now. We've talked about this in an earlier po or in one of the earlier episodes of, of mimicking mimicking the hen, and I think that's awesome. Jay's doing an awesome job with that now. But if you listen to that hen, again, if you remember back to what I just said a little bit ago about the high-pitched, fast pace, it's, it's, an, it's a hen that is seeking, that is inquisitive. She hears Jay calling, and he and she's on, she being Jay, the hen that, that Jay is, you know, imitating. She's on the ground. That hen knows that she's on the ground. At this point, that hen that's up in the tree is like, where are you? I mean, are you, you know, come under us. I, I want to see you. Where are you? I want to make contact with you. So it's a perfect example of that high-pitched, fast pace, that seeking style of plain yelp. <laughs> Alright, sorry. I don't mean to keep interrupting, but there's another good point right there. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right back. I'm going to jump right back to this point right here because this is cool. You can hear two hens doing the exact same vocalization, but you're going to be able to tell that they're two different hens. One's, high, one's got a little bit of a different voice than the other. Hear how that one's a little deeper and raspier? Gobbler's about to come unglued. <laughs> okay, let me pause that real quick. You heard that just that's where you start getting that cutting. Cutting is very similar to clucks. I mean, they're, they're essentially the exact same thing. They're the same form. The structure of the vocalization is the same form, except they just smash a whole bunch of them together in very, very fast, rapid succession. And they can be a little bit more elevated as far as volume and, and pitch. But a great, I mean, because you've heard clucks throughout this whole thing. But again, these hens are trying to figure out where Jay is and, and wondering why they haven't been able to see her, you know, the hens yet and you know, her moving around down there and so are getting more and more incessant about I want to see you, I want you to, I want to I want to make contact with you. So they just keep you know, the, the number of yelps they're that are they're doing, the string of yelps is getting longer and they're starting to throw more clucks in there and now she starts throwing some cuts in there. It's awesome. <laughs> So that gobbler, what ends up happening is the hens hit the ground, that gobbler flies right down. They all see the full strutting decoy and the jake and, and the hens, and they come right into the spread. The gobbler actually flies right into the spread, struts around and around and around, goes over and beats on the jake, and uh, is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Dave Smith strutter decoy, and uh, and then uh, Rennell was able to capture her and get her first... Uh, harvest her first uh, Gould's turkey, and that was an awesome. I just think that totally portrays, you know, up on the limb, and then, yeah. you know, obviously they flew down a few minutes later. Um, that whole clip is, I have that whole clip on my YouTube channel. 
um, beautiful birds, but I loved the hen vocalization there, not to mention the gobbler in the background was literally about to just come unglued up there on that limb. I don't, um, his, every single feather on that bird had to have been at full, I mean, just, he couldn't have popped uh, out probably anymore. <laughs> yeah, and the thing was, I, we couldn't see the turkeys in the tree from where we were set. We were kind of just around this, there was this one tree kind of blocking. Perfect. But, I mean, it was one of those situations where I knew that it was game on. And, you know, I was kind of milking it a little bit, if, if you want to know the truth. Because I, I knew that they were going to fly down and then see the decoys. And it would seal the deal that much more. And it was just a, a great morning. And that's my favorite way to set up. If I, could, if I could set up under a roost that way every single time, that is how I like Sometimes having them be able to see you from the roost sometimes isn't the best thing because they can see, wait a minute, there's no movement, you know? So sometimes the best thing to do is set up just around a clump of trees or just around the corner where they can't quite see you, but they know exactly where you are, and so they have to pitch out. And like you said, they pitch out, they see it, they bank, and they land, and they, here we come. This next clip that we're going to play is also in Sonora, Mexico with a Gould's turkey. And I think one of the things that's so cool about this clip is it's a it's an early morning roost setup. Um, and you're going to hear a real, in my mind, young hen. And she's going to have a real high pitch. You know, she's going to be doing quite a bit of kicking, you know, some high pitch sounds. And it's just Awesome. I think this is a great clip. Real high pitch there. And hopefully those purrs are coming out. Yeah, and those birds have already hit the ground. Um, they just hit the ground and just listen to this hen get after it here. For those that have heard it before, that's typically what's considered, there you go, there's another one, typically considered a kiki run, where they do a kiki, the young hen sounds, and then run right into a yelp. They're walking right by me in the leaves. The beautiful part about that is, and if people pay attention, the structure of the vocalizations is the same, but you can clearly tell that there are two different hens there, at least two different hens. Their, their voices are different, but the structure of what they're saying is the same. So that gives people, I mean, it should give you confidence that you don't have to sound like your buddy. You don't have to sound perfect. You're going to sound like an individual hen. You just have to have the structure right. They're beating on my decoy. You can hear that. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's a great clip. Great clip there. Um, this next clip is actually in Arizona. Uh, this is a Gould's turkey as well, uh, yelping. And um, it's kind of a kind of a throatier. Um, more, it more sounds like a Jake. It is a hen, but it's it's kind of an interesting uh, yelp here. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, Chris. Let's let's cut that there. Okay, I set that up wrong. Okay, 
whenever you're ready. Okay, this next clip is actually in Arizona. I was fortunate to guide a friend of mine, Casey Brooks, on the Arizona auction Goulds hunt last year. And um, you're going to hear Casey calling a little bit to this hen, but I think this is just classic, you know, kind of uh, excited, kind of aggressive hen yelping um, at its best. Oh, yeah, that low and slow, that just that, oh, yeah. That hen thinks she is the dominant hen in the area, and by dang it, you better be listening to her. I mean, that, that, that for me is that classic low and slow, dominant old boss hen. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like if you could just have her in your pocket, oh. squeeze, squeeze her you know, <laughs> squeeze her every once in a while and have her do that, you'd call in every turkey around. Gosh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, that Again, if, if the turkeys, if they're not moving your way, if they just seem to be hung up and they just keep yammering back at you, if you learn to do that, and for me, that is best accomplished with a mouth diaphragm, that it, it, a good raspy, the ra the most raspy mouth diaphragm that you can get, because you can formulate your throat and your mouth a little bit to get that ow, 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 you know, that accentuate that low, hollow note. Again, if you listen to it, it, it has a high part, it has a low part, just like all the other yelps. Whereas the high pitch, fast pace, the, you know, the, the excited or, or whatever you want to call those those excited plane yelps, they accentuate that high note. Yep, 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 yep. These accentuate that low note, and if you can learn to do that, man, if they hang up or if they're just not coming quick enough, or you need to challenge a hen, that's the vocalization to use right there. This next clip is in Arizona as well. It's a Gould's turkey, and it's yelping. And uh, we had roosted these birds the night before. Dar, my, uh, my partner in the guide business uh, and hunting partner, he was trying to shoot one with his bow. And um, his son and I were about, oh, 12 or 15 yards from the decoys because of the little open where we were. It's the only place we could set up, and Dar's just to our right. And um, these turkeys come in close, and you'll, hear, you'll listen to these hens yelping. Great clip there of those hens just yelping, having a real raspy tone. Yeah, the, the thing is, is I, I love that clip, but I almost hate it because she she 
throw it shows you right there so you can throw the rule book out the window. I mean, you know, I always talk about consistent cadence and can, you know, and, and how you, she, she just throws all that out the window. It's awesome. She, she's, she's awesome. This next clip is in Sonora, Mexico, Gould's Turkey. Uh, David Williams was with Dara and I, and uh, this was his second bird. And we're, we're all kind of set up close to these decoys. You'll hear David calling a little bit. You'll hear his buddy Andy uh, Melton uh, calling. And uh, they're going to come in and the, they're going to start. The hens are going to be beating on the hen decoys. The gobblers are going to be beating the, the uh, strutter decoy. It's, it's a pretty cool clip. Here the decoy is just getting hammered. funny part is if you ever get to see that it, the thing that always just makes me laugh is they're hitting plastic you can hear it being plastic it doesn't feel like feathers it doesn't sound like feathers but they don't care they just absolutely destroy them <laughs> yeah it's crazy a, a couple years ago i actually had a, a lone gobbler come in and knock the dave smith strutter down and literally he sat he, i have video of it for 30 minutes he sat there and he pecked the eyeball of the Dave Smith turkey yep. in the eyeball yep. until finally I just said, let's just go ahead and shoot him. And my client, boom, shot him. And I went up there and all of the paint in the <laughs> eye and around the eye was all off from the bird just sitting there pecking, 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 pecking over and over. They can be a ruthless bunch for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This next clip... Uh, is in Sonora, Mexico as well with a Gould's turkey. This is a bird uh, that I knew had hens. I knew he had one hen, and I knew I had to get aggressive with this hen and, and go back and forth with her. I let her, he obviously was gobbling in the dark, and, and uh, she started in, and I knew I had to kind of just get with her and start mimicking her. It's a great clip here to, to listen for an early morning roost setup.
Notice how like I'm not letting her finish too, and it's just frustrating her. flies out of the tree and flies right to me. The gobbler's still in the tree. Tell she's walking right to me. It was a little ditch kind of thing that she kind of popped off there, and that's what she heard her when you pop, 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 pop. Nice. So what 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 was going on in that clip is she was coming towards me, and I'm thinking she's going to get right here by me. I want that gobbler to come down, but I figured at that point I finally just kind of shut up and figured that the gobbler would fly down to her and come to both of us. And if I called too much being too close to her, I felt like, um, she was going to know something was up because on that particular set I didn't have decoys out and um, you know it, luckily the, the gobbler did fly down and um, he actually kind of flew over on this bench and then he went ahead and flew down and, and came right in and my hunter was able to shoot him. Nice. This next setup is an early morning roost setup in Arizona and you can just hear uh, this is early season. This is kind of when they're still in those big flocks that we talked about in some of the setup uh, episodes. You'll just hear a, a, a bunch of chaos. There's a bunch of hens and a bunch of gobblers in the tree.
what would you do in those situations, Chris, where you just have a ton of birds? Uh, you know, I think you at that point you have to really get after it and really get to call in to get something to come, you know, happen and come your way because there's so much going on. You almost have to be the loudest and most not necessarily loudest, but the most obnoxious hen in the group. I think. Yeah, exactly. Unless I know that they're absolutely going to pitch out and going to land right in front of me. No, you you just you do. I mean, literally, just start hammering just start hammering just loud raspy just i mean you you do you've got to stand out from the crowd you've got to make it seem like your place is where the party is that's where everybody needs to be and even if you don't get the entire big flock at least try to sucker some of them out you know again those stupid two-year-olds sucker some of them out to come check you out this next clip is a bunch of purring and clucking and then it leads into fighting and fighting purr Chris, I, I think it should be pointed out that like that fighting purr kind of, you know, if, you, if you've got a friend sitting next to you uh, and you both are running a uh, pot and peg, you know, you can. You know, you can drag that peg on that um, surface and, and make that same kind of fighting uh, per sound, and I have seen it where it just turns a gobbler, you know, upside down when he hears that. Just like a lot of times, you know, if two girls were fighting in a restaurant, who's not going to go over and watch some of that? <laughs> I mean, I know I would be the first to stand up and kind of check out and see what's going on for sure. Well, and that, and, and adding him in for in in between yelps. I mean, you, you'll hear some help, some hens start just to, that excited yelp and just. <laughs> I mean, just very, very excited. I mean, sometimes that in itself just, you know, again, when we're back to what you just asked a minute ago about how do you how do you compete with that level of excitement and all that activity going on, all of these things, you adding those fighting purrs, those aggressive purrs in there, excited yelping, all those add to it, and you're absolutely right. I mean, sometimes they're the easiest calls to make just because you don't have to be perfect with it. Stick that, you know, Take your striker, stick it in the surface, push down, and just start dragging it. Just and have your buddy in there, you know, adding it, throwing in a whole bunch of yelps and clucks and cuts and everything. Just build that just absolute cacophony of just excitement and, and just oh yeah. I mean, sometimes that's literally what it takes to get them coming. And sometimes when you do, they just drop whatever they're doing and they they're coming in. They're full strut but they can't run fast enough. They're just about tripping over themselves to get to you. I love that. All right, this last and final clip is last year, northern Arizona, Merriam's Turkey, uh, me and a friend, and I had called in this hen, and there were several gobblers kind of gobbling around, and this hen came right to me, and she finally got so close, I just had to stop calling. We didn't have any decoys set. And she ended up coming and standing, you know, five, five, anywhere from five to ten yards from us. And one of the gobblers broke free and came right over, and, and uh, my friend was able to kill this uh, gobbler. I think the thing to learn from that is just that rapid 
kind of aggressive yelping. Would you agree? Well, I mean, that that's really, from my opinion, not, not being able to see the video um, or not having seen the video yet. My guess is her head was up. She was she was looking. I mean, that's borderline assembly yelps, like a hen looking for, you know, trying to trying to gather the group together, trying to just get everybody to pool together. Um, but no, it is. I mean, and that's the thing is, I mean, you you don't ha- again, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to get the structure right. I mean, you, you heard how many hens sound different. They all have the same two tone yelp. They have a different levels of raspiness, different levels of clarity, but they've got and they all exhibit different cadence in there. So they all sound like different hens, but they have that that same, you know, starts a little bit low, you know, or high and then goes low, yelp, yelp. And you don't have to sound perfect. You can be, you know, like I said, we go back to the beginning of that effective caller. I'm not a per, you know, you don't have to be a perfect caller, just effective and get the fundamentals right. But there's so much variability in all the hens and the sounds they make. I mean, you, you, you yeah. aren't sure can kill, kill gobblers every year. Yeah, and um, I, I'm going to show and kind of demonstrate how I assembly Yelp on a box call. And it's kind of a real short, choppy stroke, and, and I've had a lot of success with this. Yep, and, there, and because in those assembly yelps, there's not a lot of rasp to it. Yeah, it's just this choppy. Okay, and then... Like you're saying, low and slow and that raspy hen, on this box, it just listen to this. Exactly. It's kind of like that, just yow, yow, yow. Yeah, exactly. Get over here. Um, that's great stuff. I think people are going to really enjoy that audio. And I think we did a pretty good job covering all the different sounds and turkey calling uh chris do you have anything to add here in conclusion no i I mean just spend time listening to it i mean that's your best teacher i mean you you, the 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 best way to learn what these sounds sound like is just listening to hens doing it um again i i know you've been gracious enough to to give my website a plug and, and i don't mean to hammer it but i mean that's the other thing too is being able to see this all happen uh, and, and watch their body language. Watch what they're doing. What, you know, who's saying, who's making the vocalizations? What is she doing? And what is the outcome of that uh, interaction? You know, does the hen come over and, and look? Is she, you know, bolt upright and seeking and looking? Is she relaxed and, and uh, more aggressive or what? You know, being able to see the body language that the bird is exhibiting while she's vocalizing is huge. I know that you're going to post some of these video clips on your. Uh, well, you've got some on your YouTube channel. You're going to post this also, uh, you said, on your YouTube channel? Yeah, I'm going to post on uh, my YouTube channel and on my uh, website. And then, Chris, as well, you have a lot of great uh, turkey vocalizations on row hunting resources. So, yeah. you know, I want to encourage the listeners to listen to the real turkeys as much as you can and, you know, take these clips that we just listened to and, you know, Listen to them over and over and over. And when you're mimicking your calls, play these sounds and mimic and try and copy them on, you know, whether you're using a mouth call, a box call, you know, a pot and peg, and try and get where, if you can make these sounds, you're going to kill turkeys. And if you can get to where you can, you know, pretty much listen to these clips and mimic these sounds exactly, you're going to kill a lot of turkeys. Well, and the other thing too, and I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier the fundamentals of how to make the sounds. Now, I know there are some people that are going to be sitting here going, you know, scratching your heads, still maybe a little confused about how we made the sounds of the box call or how we made the sounds with the pot and peg. You know, Jay, you've got stuff on your YouTube channel. Um, but if people do, if you do choose to subscribe, I, w- I would really urge beginners, if you're just starting out, please consider subscribing to that turkey module because the bulk of the turkey module is me showing video showing you how do you make the sounds of the box call? How do you formulate a Yelp properly? How do you hold the box? How do you put the lid down on the box? How do you it talks about the fundamental basics of getting the structure of the vocalizations correct and then you can launch from there. 
it builds a just an absolute rock solid foundation of knowledge for for you to catapult off of. So I think that for beginners, that's a huge benefit. And Chris, how do they find you? Uh, just everything is for us is rowhuntingresources dot you know well, rowhuntingresources r o e hunting resources. The website is rowhuntingresources dot com. It's a subscription based uh, educational resource turkey module. I think is like fifteen dollars, so it's pretty cheap. And then if you use you know if you get all the way through the subscription part, it'll ask for a coupon code or a promo code. You put in J Scott podcast, and it'll knock twenty percent off. So it's a it's a great deal for a heck of a lot of information. But by all means, you can follow us. If you want to check out our YouTube channel, it's just Row Hunting Resources. On Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all of it is all Row Hunting Resources. So definitely come over and check us out and let us know how we can help you. Awesome, buddy. Well, it's been great having you on, and this has been a fun series. And uh, I just want to thank you for all your hard work and uh, look forward to getting out in the turkey woods. And... Uh, I uh, appreciate you being on. Absolutely, my friend. Anytime. Thank you.